Tonight on NJTV News, a kumbaya moment in the high stakes gambit over Atlantic City. The mayor, the governor, and the Senate president announced a sweeping plan to save the city without declaring bankruptcy. But the deal that stops just short of state takeover would restructure the city's debt and consolidate or privatize municipal services. How does that sit with Atlantic City residents? And just south of the boardwalk, they're bailing out homes and assessing damaged dunes and reassessing their view of the governor who had to apologize for some ill-chosen wisecracks. Those stories are more next on NJTV News. Major funding for NJTV News provided in part by Barnabas Health. Life is better healthy. Online at BarnabasHealth.org and Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Live from the Agnes Varis NJTV studio at Two Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thanks for joining us. Candidates talk about how they'll get things done. Chris Christie's done it again just weeks after he brokered a deal with competing leaders of the Senate and Assembly to get casinos in North Jersey. He's moved to prepare Atlantic City's faltering finances, not with a state takeover the Senate president wanted, not the bankruptcy the city's mayor had threatened, but a compromise cut down the middle. Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron was in the room for the announcement. When Governor Christie walked out of his office with Senate President Steve Sweeney, the surprise was that Atlantic City Mayor Don Guardian was with them. Last week, Guardian was railing against a new Sweeney initiative to have the state take over the city's finances. Guardian's preferred solution was to declare bankruptcy and restructure city debt. In fact, he had called an emergency hearing of the city council tonight to do just that but cooler heads apparently prevailed. So last Thursday, I placed a telephone call to the mayor. And I told him that my view was the city needed help and I wanted to help the city. And that we needed to work together to get to a solution and not have conflict and strife between the two of us. The deal is to give the state local finance board expanded powers over the city to restructure debt, to amend or terminate all labor contracts, including those collectively bargained, to dissolve or transfer all city boards and commissions, to consolidate or share services with Atlantic County, and to privatize municipal assets like the water utility. Sweeney, who has been leading this charge for two weeks, was asked if this is indeed the T word for takeover. I don't think it's a takeover. An intervention or as me and the mayor have spoken, a partnership. But we have to fix this government. You know, it's not Atlantic City's fault they lost two thirds of their revenue all at once. But they're spending three dollars and taking one in. Mayor Guardian was asked if his change of heart was just a capitulation to the stronger force of the state. We looked at all of the options and, and basically, you know, there's four options. Do nothing, um, have the state take over, um, file bankruptcy, or form a partnership. Not, not hard to figure out what you want to do and what's best for Atlantic City and the state of New Jersey. We like being a cash cow. We like being an ATM for the state. We want to continue to do that. Christie said this solution goes farther than the payment in lieu of taxes bill he vetoed last week. This plan incorporates the pilot, he said, but goes beyond it. The expanded state powers would last five years, not the 15 in Sweeney's original announcement. Sweeney said he hopes that entices Assembly Speaker Vincent Prieto to get on board. Prieto said today he's still looking at the issue and has some concerns. Atlantic City's structural deficit is over $100 million, Christie said, and the city is dickering with the Borgata over a $160 million tax bill. Christie said after five years of a state-run tourism district and one year of an emergency manager, it's time to step up state involvement and the media can call it what they like. The bottom line now is the only thing that's really holding Atlantic City back is its governmental structure and the debt and the, and the cost of its government. There's an old adage, it's better to be at the table than on the menu. Atlantic City Mayor Don Guardian apparently arrived at the same conclusion as it regards a state takeover. At the State House, I'm Michael Aaron, NJTV News. Atlantic City Mayor Don Guardian declared the city's not dead, just wounded. But does this deal leave them feeling wounded? 
Brianna Venosi asked a member of the city council. I am very uh, pleased. I'm very enthused. I'm optimistic. Uh, we wanted a partnership, we meaning the mayor and the council from the beginning. Uh, we wanted to be included. Uh, we wanted to have a seat at the table. Uh, we want to keep our local sovereignty, and for everything I've heard, uh, this has been accomplished. Everybody on council had one goal, and that's to do what's best for the citizens of Atlantic City and to represent the citizens of Atlantic City in the best way we can, and also to make sure that we make sound and prudent financial decisions. I want to look at the specifics of what we're going to do or what's being proposed before I make a uh, comment on the specifics of it. I think the general concept is what I'm responding to. The general concept of us working together, the general concept of us having a partnership and having a seat at the table, uh, then the specifics we'll have to hash out. But when you make hard decisions, obviously uh, some people are not going to be pleased and unfortunately it's going to be some pain uh, because we're in such a deep hole. But the specifics of it we'll, we'll get to. Across the state, another town struggling to remain solvent is building a big new moneymaker. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Camden, where the Philadelphia 76ers gave a sneak peek at their spanking new 125,000 square foot training complex taking shape on the waterfront. It will be the largest team practice facility and corporate office in the NBA. What will a $44 million construction loan and $82 million in tax credits get them? Two regulation basketball courts with 10 baskets, a 2,800 square foot locker room, a press room, film room, balcony, player restaurant and business offices, and a state of the art performance recovery, hydrotherapy and wellness room. Next to Trenton, where, on the strength of expanded health training, Thomas Edison State College has morphed into a university. It's officially launched its first ever doctoral program. The Doctor of Nursing Practice is a 36 credit, 18 month long program offered only online and aimed at working nurses who want leadership roles in the rapidly changing healthcare environment. The university will take only 10 applicants at first, narrowing the focus to make sure the students meet the program's rigorous standards. Finally, Princeton, where a kindergarten class has had a surprising lesson in cryogenics. In a student's bag salad, purchased at a totally organic market, was discovered an impeccably well-refrigerated, nearly lifeless, three-inch long green anole lizard. Coincidentally, the first reptile to have its entire genome sequenced. Did the five-year-old freak out? She did not. She did what any kindergartner worth her salt would do. She warmed it back to life and brought it to her science teacher the next day. Green Fruit Loop, that's its name, is now the class mascot. And that's our Garden State Express for Tuesday, January 26. Something up in your town? Tip us off. The storm's blown over, but the tempest Governor Christie unleashed by suggesting reports of flooding had been overblown, that's still whipping up emotions down the shore where some high-powered senators saw the flood damage for themselves. Brenda Flanagan reports. Residents power washed the sand and mud off driveways and put soggy belongings out to the curb. Seattle City's still cleaning up after Saturday's storm when the back bay flooded homes. I looked out the window, there was like a river of ice just going down the street. There's a lot of high tide, this is like a river. Once it comes over the bulkhead, it's like four foot out here in the street. Silt covers the floor in John Pratt's house. How much did you lose? Mm. Whatever got wet goes, furniture and stuff. Everything. Yeah. Residents say that they're grateful the Army Corps of Engineers finished building the storm barrier on the beach back in November. But as you can see, it took a real hit in terms of erosion. A cavalcade of officials, including New Jersey's two U.S. senators, toured storm damage in Sea Isle and other shore towns today. They applauded the Army Corps' barrier. The ocean did not breach, which would have caused us much more damage. So the dunes and the beach replacement 
replenishment did their job. We'll see what the ultimate damage assessments are and to the extent that it rises to a level that the governor, if he makes a decision to ask for a federal emergency declaration, we're going to support it wholeheartedly. They saw where Steve Tymon's t-shirt shop caught fire and burned in downtown Seattle City, ironically in the middle of the storm. We survived Sandy. We came back after Sandy and now this. It's very sad. Got to see Thank if we you. can help you get up again. If you oh. want to do that? I do. The senators pledged help with a small business loan and offered comfort. Senator Cory Booker took selfies, called Time and Son on the cell phone. Hey, listen, I'm standing here with your dad, who's an amazing man. I'm very impressed by the senators. Unfortunately, the governor's not here. Even though Lieutenant Governor Guadano toured the shore yesterday, Governor Christie's decision to head back to New Hampshire and his presidential campaign continues to be a sore point here. One comment really got some people riled. I don't know what you expect me to do. You want me to go down there with a mop? What do you expect I, him to be doing? Well, I had a lot of respect for him, but I think I lost it after I heard that. The presidential race will wait. You have people with disasters here. That's your main concern. It's us here in New Jersey. But she says the town's resilient and folks here expect to clean up after storms. In Seattle City, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. The mop quip, Governor Christie called that just a joke. And he had to take back another quip, too. This one, insulting the mayor of North Wildwood, who he called crazy for saying his town had worse flooding than Sandy, adding, quote, his town didn't get hit by Sandy, so of course it's worse than Sandy. The governor today said he went one adjective too far and has apologized. I got carried away last night at a town hall meeting. It is not the first time um, that I've gotten carried away and said something that I later apologized for. It doesn't happen often, but it happens. And so I called Patrick this morning privately, and I called and, and apologized to him. He accepted my apology. I understand that he told the press that I apologized. It's fine with me. Um, that wasn't the reason for my apology. The reason for my apology was because I really felt badly about it. For today's NJTV News question, have you been able to get back to your regular routine following the storm? Share your thoughts with us on our Facebook page or tweet us. Absolutely not. So I commute from Jersey City. Uh, the PATH train is completely shut down. I had to catch the uh, number one bus. So Monday it took me like two hours to get to work. Today was a little better, so there's some hope. Pretty much trying to get to school, the buses and the rules are blocked. But they cleaning it up, so it's good. What happened to your phone? Oh my god. Um, I was getting a ride from my boyfriend at work and I uh, dropped it in the snow, tried to go back, somebody picked it up, stole it. It's just not in my routine yet. Support for the medical report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Doctors and pharmacists are increasingly sharing patient information through hyper-secure electronic medical records. They're meant to ensure better patient care at lower cost, but there's an unintended consequence. EMRs can make your personal information more vulnerable to hackers. But a new partnership is aiming to prevent those cyber attacks. Michael Hill reports. Joe Carr welcomes the state and healthcare industry partnership to protect the 200 plus members of his New Jersey Hospital Association against cyber threats and hacking. Boy, that kind of support is really important for us. The newly formed New Jersey Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Cell, called New Jersey Kick, is the state's one stop shop for cyber threats, attacks, analysis, and incident reporting. It's under the state Homeland Security Department. It has 19 state and hundreds of public and private partners with which it shares information. Today it reached out to an industry that analysts have said has been slow to adapt to new security technologies, hospitals and healthcare. So it's partnered with the National Health Information Sharing and Analysis Center. What are your capabilities? How quickly are you able to track someone down if they hack or something like that? So we have automated information and intelligence sharing. So if we're seeing something hitting our networks here in the state, we can on an immediate basis share that tactical 
information with our members. The goal here is that through information sharing, they can detect cyber threats and thwart them and ultimately prevent them. State Homeland Security Director Chris Rodriguez says it takes more than 200 days for a company to realize it's been hacked, and two-thirds of all cyber breaches target patients and relatives' personal information in medical and health care records. As the healthcare sector is also digitizing a lot of patients' information and putting that information um, increasingly on different mobile devices in order to connect and for cost efficiencies, the healthcare sector's attack surface is increasing. The state says New Jersey Kick has no interest in collecting anyone's personal information or any company's proprietary information. We're interested in cyber threat indicators, very technical oftentimes, uh, indicators of compromise uh, that, that identifies how attackers are actually defeating security controls or exploiting vulnerabilities in, in your technology. The acting state health department commissioner says the partnership is imperative. It's always a concern and we do want to be very cognizant that the techniques and the utilizations of different types of information can be evolving and that's why things like the NJ kick makes so much sense. Joe Carr says considering what's at stake, it takes a team to tackle it. You're, you're on an island, right? So the more minds you can get who are in a similar boat than you that have expertise that can all bring something to the table and then have that same expertise at a higher level at the state government who's not only seen it for this for healthcare but other sectors that's that's amazing nj kicks message hackers beware michael hill njtv news there are untold thousands of american military veterans sleeping in the streets First Lady Michelle Obama called that an absolute outrage and urged the U.S. Conference of Mayors to end what she described as a horrifying stain on our nation. Mercer County's tackling veteran homelessness head on. Lauren Wonka reports. Vietnam veteran Clint Geddes is thrilled to go through mail at his kitchen table or to fold laundry because he once called the streets home. And now? I just love coming home at the end of the day. To a two-bedroom home in Trenton. A few years ago, local agencies helped Clint, who was once addicted to drugs and alcohol, settle into this house. Now he worries about his fellow service members. It's a lot of pets out there that won't ask for help. You know, they refuse to ask for help. We you know we was taught how to survive. Which is why Mercer County, the city of Trenton, and the Mercer Alliance to End Homelessness want vets to get the help they need, says Alliance Executive Director Frank Cirillo. Together, they took on First Lady Michelle Obama's mayor's challenge to end veteran homelessness by the end of 2015. We had identified the whole population of uh, single adults who were in homelessness, and we broke out, specifically had broken out veterans. And we found that there were 79 in the community who uh, were currently homeless. All the veterans are now in permanent housing, except for two who declined the offer, says Frank. The process took about a year. That is the cornerstone of what the Alliance believes is, is the, the best vehicle for keeping people out of homelessness. Permanent housing creates a sense of place, creates a sense of stability, of well-being. Uh, it is a real quality of life issue with most people. We believe that uh, here in the city of Trenton, everybody should have a right to have somewhere to live. It's good for our veterans as well to be a part and included in that process to provide housing for those that will go fight for us and come back to provide them with housing. The Alliance received the veterans' names from area organizations that work with the homeless community. That information was sent at Trenton's recently opened Coordinated Entry and Assessment Services Center. Here at the C Center, the chronically homeless meet with case managers to find permanent housing that suits their needs. Frank says homeless veterans are prioritized here. Most veterans have vouchers from the federal government, says Frank, to help cover the rent. Case managers reach out to landlords and community groups that offer housing. After the vets are handed the keys, they're provided with support services. When we get people in housing first, uh, put a roof over their head, we are easier, we're more able to wrap around services, get them the drug treatment that they need, get them the food that they need, get them the social services that they need to, to really have a, a, a handle on the problems that are facing them. Frank insists identifying the names of the veterans has been fundamental to the program's success. It's to take 
the label and the stigma of homelessness and put it on the back end of things. What we do is address them as vets, recognize their contribution, talk to them about what they need as human beings, fellow human beings who happen to be homeless. These leaders agree, although they've helped house veterans, the problem won't disappear. But with the system in place, they're confident they'll continue to help vets like Clint find a place to call home. In Trenton, I'm Lauren Wonko, NJTV News. More than a million people here, including many who have homes, earn too little to provide basic necessities. The federal poverty rate for a family of four is $23,000, but New Jersey families find they need just over 61,000 to survive. They are Alice families, defined by the United Way as asset limited, income constrained, employed and still chasing the dream. Michael Hill recently spoke with its North Jersey CEO, John Franklin. John, the country went through a tough time economically. There's been some recovery. How has the recovery impacted New Jersey families? Well, if we look back to the Great Recession, uh, a number of people suffered, not just because of the increase in the number of our Alice population that we're gonna talk about, but the cost of living for them has been devastating. And how have they managed to manage all this? What do they do to get by? Well, I think that's the, the crux of the conversation here. If you look at the Alice population, that's the asset limited, income constrained, employed population, those people not making enough but working, they run up credit card debt, they drive a car that's not safe, they live in substandard housing, they make a choice between do I pay the heating bill or do I feed my kids? And what kind of money are we talking about? What kind of salaries do they, what kind of money do they make a year? For a family of four, you need 60,000 bucks a year in New Jersey. Um, if you look at the federal poverty guidelines, $23,500 a year for a family of four. So the Alice population you're talking about makes how much? Uh, between 25,000 bucks a year and 60,000 bucks a year. The Assembly Speaker Vincent Prieto was talking about on January 27th convening four legislative committees to address this specific thing that you're talking about. Your thoughts on that? Hallelujah. I mean, we have some data that I think will enlighten that conversation. We hope that will be the standard of data for that conversation because it broadens, it gets beyond the 200% of the population, 200% of the poverty level to more specific data so we can understand county by county, town by town, what it costs to live and what people are making in those communities. So it's more precise data. What do you expect to come out of this legislative committee, this legislative effort, four committees meeting on the 27th to address this? Well, I hope we'll have a good conversation and change the tone of the conversation, change the mindset of folks. You know, on the way over here, we were approached on our car by two homeless folks. That's what people think of when you think of poverty. They don't think of that family where both people are working, each making 15 bucks an hour and can't make it. And how many households in New Jersey we're talking about who would fit the definition of Alice? 850,000 roughly. How can that be? In a, yes, in a wealthy state, yes. I think the cost of living here, the cost of taxes, everything that, that makes it expensive to live here means that you have to earn more money. And when the jobs don't pay more money, you end up with 850,000 families, households that can't afford to live here. But John, would you describe the things that they do to manage this situation and improve it would put them worse off? Yes, and that's why it's, this is not just an issue about Alice. This is an issue for all of us. Alice is trying to realize the American dream. And if she can't pay the heating bill, if she can't feed her kids, the dream is lost. And if it's lost for Alice, it's gonna be lost for all of us. I know the assembly speaker is holding these legislative sessions, but in general, do people who set policies and make policies and make law in a place like New Jersey, do they get this? As long as we say that the poverty level is $23,500 a year for a family of four, I don't see how they can get it. But with the Realis report that we've done, it lays out very specific data, county by county, that will help people understand that, indeed, we have a problem. They will understand that our kids coming out of college, our parents living on Social Security, the people taking care of our people, our, our families in the nursing home, our kids in childcare, all of those people are Alice, people we need. Nobody understands that yet, but we're going to. And these are the people who, for the most part, the kind of money you're talking about that they make every year, they make 
barely enough to take care of their necessities or, or barely? Barely enough, yeah. And if you look at the statistics, the way we laid them out, with the money they earn, help from Social Security or help from the hospital or other nonprofits or TANF, any of those, those helps, they still don't have enough. And what you'll find is there's about a 34% gap in what they need just to survive. All right. John, we'll have to leave it there. Let's hope that there's some progress on this issue. John Franklin, CEO of United Way of Northern New Jersey. Thank, Thank you very much. Tomorrow on NJTV News, Atlantic City's mayor and council accept diminished responsibility in return for greater financial stability, and lawmakers work to move people out of poverty. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, we'll see you tomorrow. New Jersey manufacturers, auto insurance, and more for New Jersey Business and Industry Association members and their employees. PSE&G, serving customers, strengthening the business community, and investing in New Jersey's future. And the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. Camden students face a lot of challenges, but they meet them with determination and drive. Teachers like Ms. Harris make me feel like I'm part of a team. Not just on a basketball court, but in a classroom. Chanel is not just a star athlete, she is a star student. I'm headed to Clemson University, where I can combine my love of sports and learning, and maybe even win a championship. I wouldn't bet against her or any of my students reaching for their dreams. Chris Christie's done it. A garden class has had a surprising called New Jersey Kid.